so I'm presenting or so it's me, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. So welcome everybody. Oh, oh, we thought it would be good if we first, before we go into today's topic, which will be the Rust plugin language, if we tell you a little bit about Visual Software Hour, because today we probably have few new watcher, watchers to the stream. So Visual Software Hour is something that we started in April this year. This is show number 17. We do that more or less weekly with with a summer break and maybe soon a, a winter break. Um, maybe we can also screen share um, the website to give you a bit of an overview of the past topics that we did. Uh, should I do that? Yes. Okay. And we will, add, we will also add the link to, I think it's also linked from Twitch. So here are the past 16 shows we, we talked about. So we have sometimes an interview, we talked about code review, about testing, packaging, how we organize projects, uh, then reproducibility, Conda. Then we had a session about Git Annex. We talked about uh, how we work on supercomputers. Then the last two shows were about containers and uh, debugging. Hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. What is the target audience, right, the one? Target audience are, I think, researchers and programmers at all levels who want to learn from each other things that maybe we didn't, that nobody taught us in our formal courses. So that we exchange tricks and tips and solutions, and we ask each other questions. Yeah. So that's the, that, how do you see it? Yes, I agree. Yeah. We also use this as a, a so the goal was with, to go on to Twitch was to try out this medium, reach more people, hmm. maybe in a better way. Also, we record these sessions so they they are available. We use this HackMD for questions and answers and comments, and it's linked from from Twitch. Mm -hmm. And please also use it to, to ask us questions. Please also use it to answer questions of others. I should also say that today is a little bit unusual time because normally up to now, we have been using, we have been doing this in the evenings and I think we will continue. So this was, we started Tuesday evening, uh, Central European time. No, normally now we use Thursday evening Central European time. Today is different because we wanted to combine this with the the online get together of Nordic resource software engineers. So that's why this is uh, on a different day today and a different time today. <laughs> yeah. So should we begin about Rust? So. What's Rust? And why is it called Rust anyway? Yeah, first question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, what it's called Rust. Uh, but I can say that sometimes with Rust, you also see this the, the little crab animal uh, uh, yes. emoji so that you see often. Hmm. And, and people writing Rust and who, who like Rust are then Rust, Rustacians. Uh, like I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but like crustaceans. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I that's see. Why this, uh, that's why this cute, cute animal. I don't know where the name comes from. We can yeah. also say a little bit later about the history. I want to point. So there are at least two interesting resources. I will put it on HackMD. One, one interesting slide deck, which was from mm. by the person who, well, uh, co-started Rust, and then one interesting YouTube talk, which talks about the history of Rust. I will put that on the HackMD, but I think we'll maybe come to the history. Should we start with the history or we come to it later? First, we talk about why. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, well, take your pick. So I will just copy these things what over to HackMD. Yeah, what about why and then the history? So from what I've heard of Rust, it has some modern features like memory safety and type safety and things like that. So you can do basically what you would in a language like C, but 
safer and faster and feel better about doing it. Would you say that's a good description? I think it's a good description, but it's not the reason why I was interested in Rust. Mm. Why were the you first interested? reason was performance, because mm -hmm. I, I think that probably rather than mention it first to me, then mm -hmm. when I looked, I, I could see it, it was supposed to be very efficient. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the primary reason why I was so interested. Yeah. So efficient compared to to Python, uh, high, to R, to, yeah, to the mm -hmm. high-level programming languages. Yeah. yeah. And is it similar to compiled languages if they're written well? Yes, so similar yes. in speed. And I should I should write some, pick up some data. But uh, basically, you can write code which runs as fast as C mm -hmm. or C++ or Fortran. Yeah. It has been also designed to do that. I mean, this is really, uh, it, I think it has been designed with the goal to create a language for system tools, mm -hmm. but with with uh, some advantages. And yeah, and we can we can also talk about the advantages. And the way I uh, got into Rust coding was that I saw it flying by, like on Twitter and on the internet, but I thought it was not a language for me because it was never mentioned together with research software. Mm -hmm. It was mentioned with, OK, I thought that this is something for sysadmins, and I think it is some, something for people who write I don't know, uh, like Linux tools. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the problems that it's solving are problems that I think we have in research. We need mm -hmm. speed and we also need the safety. And mm -hmm. not so much, maybe not so much of a problem that if something's crashing or not, but I'm definitely very concerned about memory safety and threat safety mm -hmm. and parallelizability. Mm -hmm. So does mm -hmm. Rust replace like, do you think Rust will replace things like Python and R, or C, C++, and Fortran? So it think... takes so much time anyway to replace a language. <laughs> well, let's say not <laughs> replace, but which does it substitute for? The C, C++, Fortran. Yeah. You think so? Um, yeah. I think to do that, they would need to be a bit more like aggressive on how they make um, they advertise themselves because, as you said, mm -hmm. they they don't advertise uh, themselves as research uh, software. Mm -hmm. More, more, uh, and for the same reason, people are maybe not going too much into the rest. But why I think it's very powerful. Yeah, but it it would take uh, fifteen years. But um, yeah. uh, also agree with Anne here that uh, this is more about. Um, so for the researcher who thinks about, okay, I want to start a new project, what should I write it in? Mm -hmm. not, uh, I'm also, I don't think, I don't think neither Fortran nor C nor C++ will disappear anytime right. soon, mm -hmm. I think ever, because I mean, nobody will want to rewrite the last 40 years. Yeah. It, 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 so I, I don't think this will happen. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think Rust is a good addition also for research. And I think it's a good, yeah. I think it can be very interesting to combine an R with Rust, Python with Rust. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll also mm -hmm. have a time to show that Rust can be nicely combined with C and C++ yes. and Fortran, yeah. because yeah. again, we shouldn't rewrite everything. Yeah. Uh, but nice uh, combine. And speaking of speaking of rewriting everything, I will also put on a few links on the HackMD. So there are a couple of tools which are nice replacements for uh, for the commands that we use every day, like ls, grep, cut, uh, find. Mm -hmm. So these have been rewritten to Rust, and there is also a nice blog post which shows 100, 100 binaries in Rust. I will put that on Hacking. Mm -hmm. So what are the main features of Rust, like if you gave the list? So I see some that we had written before, so fast but also safe. Yes. Yeah. Um, Fast and also safe, and also this this list is actually accessible from the HackMD. We have this material from which we use. So there is this Rust demo, and here there I have summarized this. So it is fast, but also safe. Safe in terms of maybe fewer bugs because we detect more bugs at compile time and maybe less memory bugs. We will come back to that. Mm -hmm. A zero cost of abstractions, meaning that I can write high level code which is very readable and very high level in terms of abstraction. Mm -hmm. But it will it will be compiled to a code that is as fast as if I if I wrote it really managing the memory myself. Mm -hmm. Which 
So what does that mean? Does that means that I think in Rust we shouldn't worry about we should write code that is readable, hmm. and it will. But the compiler will help us to write code that is then a, a, that to compile it into a fast code. So we don't have to we don't have to sacrifice abstraction and clarity mm -hmm. for speed. I think a wonderful thing about Rust is the type system. So oh, it, yes, is, yeah. it matches up all the types at compile time. So you cannot mm -hmm. pass an yeah. integer mm -hmm. into a flow yeah. and not know what will happen or, or an integer into a bool. Mm -hmm. So for Fortran users, usually they claim that uh, in many other programming languages are not as good for this reason. But I, I think Rust uh, outperformed mm -hmm. this. It, it, and it is really very nice. Uh, yeah. The syntax is simple. I think maybe we, we can show some examples. Mm -hmm. Yes, the memory so. safety, uh, meaning that things like memory leaks are difficult to do. Uh, memory corruption is difficult to do. Um, th threat safety, meaning if I, I can write multi-threaded code, parallel code, without worrying too much because it's Rust will prevent me from doing like race conditions. Mm -hmm. I also really like that all the all the variables and all the functions are private by default. And if I want them to be public, I have to explicitly say so. Uh, also, everything is immutable by default. And if I, I want so. to make it mutable, mm -hmm. I have to explicitly say so. So this, this helps me writing safer code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The compiler catches uh, most errors at compile mm -hmm. time. Which also With nice compare. error messages, actually. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice error messages. <laughs> no, but that's true. Yeah. And maybe we can yeah. try it later. So later we can maybe introduce yeah. some errors and see um, how that looks. Yeah. So and there's there's a question here. How good is the multi-dimensional array and plotting functionality, like NumPy, Matplotlib equivalents? Like, is that what Rust tries to do, or is it more low level? And then add-on packages would provide that. There are packages for plotting. That's what I was trying yesterday. Um, and they are uh, actually, it's very uh, good quality and it's quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure this is uh, how I would do it. I would probably uh, uh, do like rather than mentioned before, interfacing with Python for plotting. Mm -hmm. But okay. they have, uh, I think this is still in terms of uh, libraries. It's still not uh, widely used. So you don't have so many libraries available. So I was looking, for instance, uh, libraries in my uh, geoscience field. Mm -hmm. There are several, but uh, they are not always very well maintained. Mm -hmm. And the solution okay. can then lead to interface to, yes. a, uh, to a library written in a different language. Yeah. OK. So should we show how to get started? I'm interested yes. in making a first package. Sounds good. So, Is something about the history also? Or oh, yeah. History. Oh, yes, so, yes. Super briefly, that this is a new language. Uh, I think so what is, is new for our language? <laughs> that I think it is first stable release is in 2015. Yes, so, so it's extremely release. new. Yeah. yeah. It is the newest language that I have, ever, I think, ever used, uh, mm -hmm. the youngest language. It, it started in what, maybe 10 years ago, and it started around within Mozilla research. Mm, okay. And, and then it grew out, and, and of course it's open source, and now it's used in a in a number of projects. But yeah. this is where this is where it started. So is Mozilla behind it? Like, is that the driving force? I think not sure anymore. Originally, I think right now I'm also not sure. Many many of the people driving the project are working or have worked at Mozilla at some at some time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Let's make an Should example. Should I share my screen and you can tell me what to do? Yes, we also yes. wanted to talk about the memory model, but maybe we show it. Oh, rather than we, rather yes, than maybe about you it. can yeah, show it. Yeah, maybe better to show. Because okay. it's something different. The memory model is something really different compared to other languages. But yeah. to start with a, with a Hello World, some simple example. Should we say how to so, install? Should we talk about it? We uh, hmm. Maybe briefly, but I guess this can also be looked up by people. Yeah. So. So we have followed the official installation recommendations, and I will put a link. So in this Rust demo, uh, Git, GitHub repository, we uh, we have it in more, more mm -hmm. detail. 
And it can be yeah. installed everywhere. So I also install it on Windows. Yeah. You, you, do you have? A, I don't know if we and have tried on Mac, but uh, on Linux there is no problem. Yeah. So I guess that's the same yeah. on Mac. Yeah. What I also like is that I could install it also on a supercomputer without asking anybody and without mm -hmm. doing any. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I got a little bit annoyed that the official way to install was down a curl pipe to sh with some shell script which did unknown things to my home directory but well i could make it work anyway so yeah so the first yeah. thing to do i think let's start with um, cargo new and a name so cargo new will it will create a new folder mm -hmm. for you and the name will be the name of the package the mm -hmm. project so it's a project yeah so it, it works by a project So, is cargo a thing? How does cargo relate to Rust? So, is it sort of all the tooling of Rust, but not actually the compilers and stuff like that? Yeah, it's all the tooling. So, there is the Rust compiler, which is then Rust C. And cargo is, at least the way I look at it, is everything else. So, it's the tooling. It's the tooling to create projects, to auto format, to test, to document, mm -hmm. to package, yeah. to, to run, to build. Mm -hmm. So we will see that we don't need any make files, nothing like that. So all that is done by Cargo. Okay. So it's a bit like a, a Conda, but for yes. Rust. Mm -hmm. Is Rust really usable without Cargo? And let's say not, is it not, technically not really. possible, but does anyone ever do that? I think that will be... Like... I mean, this is what we do with uh, the Jupyter. That's what we will show. We are mm -hmm. not using the Cargo. And you see that you are... mm -hmm. I found that it was quite limited. It's nice for prototyping. But mm -hmm. as soon as you want to create a proper project, uh, it's not possible. Yeah. OK. OK, so. So now we've we got a folder, and yeah. inside there, you can even do a, you can see that there is even some Git, Git files. So there is a Git ignore for you. So you could now, and I wonder whether it already initializes mm -hmm. the Git for you. Yes, it, I yes, think it, it did it initialize the Git. So you see that there is the cargo tunnel, which has the metadata like mm -hmm. author version and this is the place where you add dependencies of your package mm -hmm. so this is the equivalent of requirements.txt or environment.yaml in in uh, virtual env or conda mm -hmm. under dependencies okay so okay and but right now we don't depend on anything and there is the src so yeah. all the sources go into src and right now there is only one mm -hmm. which is the main one that's the main file and this will be the, the entry point for binary packages. Yeah. And you can have a look inside. Uh, you will see that there is already a function prepared for you as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Can we have it with syntax highlighting? Yes. There we go. So there is a function. It starts with fn. It's a main function, and it will print hello world. And I mean, later we can try to modify this. But mm. uh, now, okay. maybe the next step would be to to build the, the project and to run it. OK. Um, let's see. Where should I? I guess I can build it from here. Yeah. So how do we oh, build uh, it? You build with cargo build. OK. And this builds now without optimization. So this is good during the development. If you want with optimization, mm -hmm. you would say cargo build dash dash release. Does it build with uh, debug okay. info by default? Because I see uh, unoptimized. Yes, so the, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. The cargo build is with debug info. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And nice. now you got it built. The binaries, they are now under target. So target is something that is then normally ignored in a Git mm -hmm. repository. And this contains later the the libraries and the binaries. Everything mm -hmm. will be there. So if you could run it directly here, yeah. but the, I would say maybe the, the more Standard Normal way would be to do yeah. a cargo run. Cargo Just like run that. Will, mm -hmm. yeah, this will now run the your your binary yeah. package, and in Rust speak, that would be the binary create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we wanted to create libraries, then we wouldn't have a main.rs, we would have a libs.rs. Mm -hmm. And then, as the project grows, we could add additional files and split the code into modules. What is really nice is that uh, you don't need any make file. So you just put the code into these modules, mm -hmm. you list them, 
in lips.rs and they get built. You don't need any make, any CMake to build trust projects. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, order. Uh, you can use a function before you define it. Mm -hmm. It's different mm -hmm. from other languages. So this is probably why you don't need this um, make file. Okay. Yes, we don't have to. You don't have to worry about like ordering things, like we do in in Fortran. Yeah. Which is nice for uh, for defining, uh, for instance, the interfaces. You can okay. think about uh, the interface and then yeah. write your code. So okay. So what else can I do here? Can I have it read a either argument from command line or something from the keyboard? and then print out that or use it for something or what do you think would be a next step here well we could show that i'm to to read command line I mean, it can be done sort of manually but i like to use libraries like like i do in python so there are mm -hmm. libraries that help you with that okay yeah let's Maybe do that you, uh, we can see the library use. use okay what we could also do is that we go into the pi example and mm -hmm. try that and then we see something actually more yeah, okay. I think it's nice to see some some more code because we have seen a print. Yeah. So, will you go to the Pi example then? Maybe just clone the, the example. Yeah. Me. Okay. It, so uh -huh. you yeah. clone it or I clone it, and we show okay. things. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's see. There's. Let me find the link. Ah. Uh, Uh, there we go. Okay. So here we are. What do we have? We see, I see both a cargo file and then a Pi project file here. Yeah, and that's for later. So we can now right now ignore all this Python stuff because that's, if I have time, I will show how to how to have a project that can do both that has a Python interface but underneath use mm -hmm. Rust. So right now we can ignore Py project. Or we can ignore requirements for text. Mm -hmm. I think we, as a starting point, we only look at Rust, and the only thing that Rust looks at is the cargo toml. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's the first thing you look at. I mean, I don't know, but that's usually what I look. Yeah. At. Okay, so let's take a look. So we see. And here we have more things. There is, this is again some Python things, but the interesting part here is if you go down to dependencies. So mm -hmm. here we depend on two, two outside packages. One is for random numbers, so written by somebody else, and we include it. And the other one is PyO3, which will help us to create a Python interface. Mm -hmm. So a guest cargo will automatically download and install these. And we will see that. So now when you do cargo build, it will start downloading these things. Okay. And it will also build it will build the dependencies and it will build also your project. And it will cache them. So if you then mm -hmm. they are somewhere on your hard drive and then if you so if you are there already yeah. there, then it's not rebuilding every time. So do you know where they put it? I think yeah. it depends. Let me see. I think there is a dot cargo in your home. There is a dot cargo, yeah, in your home. Because I was wondering mm -hmm. if you have several projects if uh, every time you have to don't know the game. I haven't checked. Yeah, so, so there's one per home normally, I think, at mm -hmm. least from my mm -hmm. computer. Okay. So this will start filling up my home directory and um Yeah, you have to this, be careful. Is this package cache or is this the working build for one particular project or what is here? So here we get Oh, you get all these dependencies. I think you also. The, I think the sources are somewhere because they are compiled and they get all thrown into mm -hmm. somewhere there. But I don't remember. It was never a problem for me. I, I could never fill up my mm -hmm. disk. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the kind of thing we should know about because when users start getting their space, their home directory space filled up on our cluster, and have no idea how it's happening that will cause some support yes, request I, for us. I think it's a bit like the conda when you, you mm -hmm. can fill up 
bei your home. Ja. Bei den, uh, here it's in the dot cargo, so user may not even mm -hmm. be aware. Okay. I don't, I don't know if we can clean at some point. I haven't yeah. done it. Okay, so uh, here we are. And so the question I can be, but maybe we can come back to that about uh, scientific computing availability of libraries. Just that you can't get there. We will get there. We can maybe talk a little bit more to this example first. Yeah. So, okay, we had done cargo build, right? Yes. There is also a cargo check, which you can try. If you. This can, mm -hmm. this can be useful. This will actually not compile the binaries and libraries, but it will check whether all the tab tabs are matching up. Mm -hmm. And that is normally quicker. And uh, the reason why I say that is that I often find myself developing, developing, and actually not, not, never, not even building the project, mm. not even testing the project. I'm mm -hmm. just checking whether the types are matching up. Yeah. And then at yeah, the end of the day, I'm, I'm building it, and I'm surprised that it's working. Mm -hmm. Just by yeah, the, so the power of type, type system. Yeah. OK, we can, in this case, we cannot, do, we cannot do cargo run, because there is no there is no binary crate. So if you go under uh. SRC, this is an example for a library package. OK. And under, so now, now we have more files. So there is stuff for random numbers. There is something mm -hmm. that computes approximate spy. And there is lib, mm -hmm. which then, uh, and that summarizes where all the files are. So if you if you want, you could have a look under, mm -hmm. I don't know, random.rcrs or py.rs to see some more mm -hmm. real life code. So can, can you explain that for people? Is it like uh, the libraries from just from your project, or is it external libraries? So this is the library that is is this project. So this okay. project will be a library. The this is rs lists all the files, mm -hmm. and it it specify what is it specifies the interface of our current project. Mm -hmm. In Python, this will be a little bit equivalent to double under in it, mm -hmm. slightly equivalent mm -hmm. yeah. to this this file. Yeah. So this. This is wait. This is random.rs. That's the external. Okay. Uh, is it this one? Oh yeah. The, the top line here. We suddenly. This is here. We import something from outside. Okay. So this is the dependency here, and then we're using these yeah. it's three. It's a bit names. like the import. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing to point out here is if you look at the function definition it's pub fn random point so it's a public function because we want to be able to call it from outside this mm -hmm. module um, we also see that number of points we always specify a type so there is not just num points but it's num points u size u size is a type mm -hmm. and and then we okay. return a vector of points and a point is a structure we defined on top so we defined that a point has two floating point numbers x and mm -hmm. y so everything mm -hmm. has a type mm -hmm. And the u size, that's a type that says that it's like an integer but cannot be negative. OK. Because yeah. we cannot have minus five points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. They have many different types. It's very precise. Even yeah. in terms of precision, you can have 32, 64. Mm -hmm. OK. So then here we make the new random number generator from What's the syntax here in the square brackets? Is this a seed? Is this yeah, an array? Is, is it? So that's, an, that's a vector of uh, 32 zeros, okay. which is one way of specifying the seed. Mm -hmm. And then we, I think the interesting thing to point out here is that two lines below, we create a new vector, mm -hmm. but we declare it mutable, let mute, mm -hmm. because we need to modify it later. If, if this was not mutable, we will not be able to push to it. So a few, a few lines below, you see that we then add random numbers to this vector. Mm -hmm. If this is not, uh, if you don't want to be mutable, you just use let yeah. for defining. Yeah. And that's really a good thing. That it's good that by default it's immutable because it yeah. this will mm -hmm. not let me modify things accidentally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The same for function. If you don't put pub, you cannot uh, use the mm. function outside. Mm -hmm. I, I was caught with it very, very beginning. It's, yeah. But it's very good practice. OK. So and then uh, if, what we could try is again, we try to we try some of the cargo tools on it. Yeah. 
Okay. So Can I off. ask something before? Sure. So up here, like these kind of syntaxes, are you happy with the syntax or what inspires these syntaxes? Does it come from some other language? Like coming from Python, I know they put a lot of effort into making sure every syntax is very obvious, but not everything yeah. here is that obvious to me if I didn't yes. already know where it was really coming like from. I the syntax, and I think they put a lot of thought into it. I think years of design. Mm -hmm. it, and this can be really seen. I think the, the line you are right now at, I agree that that is maybe not the best example, mm -hmm. not even the, the import on top. But generally, yeah. I find the syntax readable and intuitive, and mm -hmm. not there is not a lot of boilerplate, so not a lot of yeah. too many parentheses. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite readable. That's right. Yeah. I mean, do you consider this block here to be as easy to understand as Python, for example? Yes. You don't think so? Uh, I have to parse the different lines and. I mean, it's not bad. Like, I sort of have an intuition for what it means, but actually doing the parsing makes me think. But of course, it's because I'm new here, so. And this is not the easiest think. example because here many things are packed into few lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe so, we can later show some more. Yeah. Some nicer code. So, are we going to lib or pi next, or we're building? Yeah, I mean the lib. You can show the lib. Uh, yeah, let's show the lib. It's nice to show the lib. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here on uh, we see that we list the modules. And that's all we need. So this is mm -hmm. all that the the make file mm -hmm. doesn't exist that that it needs to build. Mm -hmm. We also say that this pi approximation function that should be a public function of our library. Okay. So that's our interface. Yeah. And on top, you see this hands-on demo of the Rust programming, which is actually a documentation string if you want to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will also see cargo doc, and it will create automatically create documentation, and it uses these strings, these doc strings. Yeah. Okay. So this create this one is uh, what we will see when we package. This is a visible uh, user interface for the moment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now do we build or look at Pi? So we have already built, I think. Okay. I just yeah, wanted... we did Cardo build. We did it already. Yes. So we have to execute now. Okay. How do we execute? Because yeah, it's a we... package now. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. we cannot really run it. Mm -hmm. because it's not it's a library so we can call it from something else but i wanted mm -hmm. to show a few more really nice tools one is cargo format fmt which is an auto formatter mm -hmm. and right now it will do nothing because this was already formatted mm -hmm. uh, so what i often do is i, I write the code in a messy way it doesn't matter mm -hmm. or a, a later you auto format so there is no there is no discussion in in rest mm -hmm. on should the parentheses be on the next line or on the same line yeah there is no discussion. Oh, this is nice. So, yeah, yeah, I mm -hmm. didn't realize that. Yeah. And okay. also at our fingertips is automated testing. So if we do mm -hmm. cargo test, it will run the tests. And again, we have the option like cargo test release mm -hmm. or or not. And this is now running automated testing. And this this is yeah. defined in if you look under tests. So there we have tests. Uh, so folder. we have the tests okay. folder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is integration tests. If you can have a look. Uh. Okay, there we go. So, so here, this is even more than Conda yeah. as a package manager because it, it can do some continuous integration. It can run test. What right. does this top thing here mean? The test, the, the a, hash that's test. That's a macro which which tells Rust that the next function is a test function. Mm -hmm. And it will, okay. edit, it will edit it to the number to the tests. Yeah. Okay. Is hash the common character in Rust? For macro? No, it's for macros. No. It's, okay. uh, the comment would be uh, to... Slash slash. Like in yeah. yeah, so it's sort of like inspired by C-ish kind of stuff. Maybe. Well, anyways. Yeah, that, it's a mixture, I, guess. I think. Yeah. I, I see a lot of different inspirations here. Okay, so there we go. Let num points and assert that it's somewhat close. Okay, yeah. And maybe two, two more cargo things before we change gears. And one is we can try cargo doc, which is creates, it builds the documentation. Mm -hmm. And then it creates a web page 
a little bit similar to like Sphinx or Doxygen or, um, mm -hmm. or Oxygen or one of these. Yeah. And maybe one more. So there is Cargo Clippy, which is inspired by the Windows cl Clippy from the end of the 90s. I don't know if people remember, like the, the thing that popped up on your screen and gave you advice. Mm -hmm. But this time it's really, really helpful. So it can, it can give you hints mm -hmm. on, you can try Cargo Clippy. Because mm -hmm. it will give us tips on how to improve the code. Yeah. Like, I guess this is really hard to see with this yellow. And oh, yeah. There's... So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So these return, they're actually unnecessary. But I put them okay. there because, mm, I, see. because there I wanted to show that uh, we can. Mm -hmm. So this can be useful. And something we will maybe not show, but we can say is that with Cargo Publish, yeah. I could now publish this package onto the package, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is then, which is it maybe can show the uh, the website because I, I was amazed yeah. by this so yeah, because with one there? command you, you you publish your your package mm -hmm. so you need to to log in and you can log in with github if you want to publish mm -hmm. but this is quite uh, simple yeah Oh, would someone else like to demonstrate this, or should I? Yeah, I didn't want to demonstrate it because no, I but just show the, the the website. Yeah, that it yeah. exists because mm -hmm. once we put something there, we cannot remove it. Mm -hmm. and that's good. I, I really like the fact that uh, things cannot be removed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah. What next? So there is this question we should maybe answer, and then we can go have a look at uh, Binder. Okay. And later maybe at mixing languages so the question was on hackmd can you comment on where rust stands right now with respect to the package available uh, packages available that offer functionalities for scientific computing example something like numpy scipy or machine learning or do you think it is sufficient for general scientific computing hmm. Hmm. they have many uh, packages actually um the thing is, uh, where I struggle the most sometimes is to, to find which one would be the most suitable for my uh, community. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's not so, so, I mean, it's, it's not so well known yet. Mm -hmm. So you have plenty of them. I don't know how you do that, rather than. Hmm. Yes, so for everything that I needed, I found it, somebody else already programmed it. But it, it is a new language, and I have also seen or packages which have been semi-abandoned. Mm. Or if if the library is not available, it's it's very it's relatively simple to interface to C, C++, Fortran, Python. So it is possible to also combine to use these from from other example math libraries. Uh, I think there are crates for math libraries, but one could also equally well use libraries like LaPak Glass mm -hmm. via this interface. Yeah, and actually the, that's what I have found for, for instance for the, all the formats, specific format and binary file we are using in GeoScience. Yeah. They have interfaced with the C library. Yes. And I was uh, I was surprised at how simple it yeah. is mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. And I can maybe show that later because uh, Rust has been designed for it to be simple because it has been designed to live in an ecosystem where everything else is written in C++. Mm -hmm. C++. Yeah. Do you think that in the long term it might be that Rust is used to make some of these packages, like the low-level extension, and then there are interfaces to Python R, so on, and then for many people the high-level languages stay as the glue language to connect the different numerical parts? And then I guess yes. if you need more, then you can do all your code in Rust, and it fe still feels better than yeah. C right or Fortran right strategy. now. strategy, and that's what I try to do for my own project. So the high-level thing is done in, in Python, mm -hmm. also because Python is still more accessible for others. Mm -hmm. But then underneath, it can call different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. So we can we can look at binder. We can also talk a little bit about the memory model, but maybe that's technical because the yeah. memory allocation works a bit different in Rust. Mm -hmm. so this has advantages, but it has also it's a bit of a it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. We can also then later show mixing of languages. Yeah. So I'm interested in mixing of languages, 
um, I mean, memory model, model, we could do a few sentences at the end, perhaps. But Should we have a look also look at, meantime, the, at the binder? Yeah, I think the binder would be a good thing to do next. I mean, the, well, we can show quite quickly and maybe do the demo the mixed languages with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK, great. Do you want to do it, uh, yeah. Rachel? Yeah, uh, me do binder. Or do you want to share a screen? You can do oh, it. I can do it. OK, yeah. uh, let me find the binder link. I can put it in the. In the chat, the repository, there is a um, okay. my launch. Hopefully, everything has been paid recently. So Can you put it in the HackMD? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is actually, it is at the top. Material uh, we use, we will use. OK, this one. Yeah. OK. Okay, so launch binder. So it, it may take a few, uh, hopefully not too long. Okay. So you, maybe we can talk about them. Oh, I needed to share um, my desktop. So I found this up here under Rust examples. And then here there's launch binder. And that took me to here. So the rationale for me was the, trying to see if teaching this language would be um, feasible using, for instance, uh, the Jupyter notebook, mm -hmm. as we usually use it for teaching Python. That was mostly the rationale. And uh, I tried it out, and I, I liked it initially for prototyping. Mm -hmm. But as we mentioned before, as soon as you want to do a bit more, you want to use Cargo. And then uh, I, I went back to the command line, which you can do in, with Binder, because mm -hmm. you can ask for a terminal. Um, so I think it's, it's quite limited with this kind of uh, uh, compiled uh, language. Or mm -hmm. it's more than this, because you have this package mm -hmm. manager you want mm -hmm. to use. Yeah. For many things using Jupyter, I find that Jupyter is good for some things, but I always eventually go back to the command line to do some other maintenance stuff in the background. And the good thing is it's so easy. Yeah, so it, it will take maybe a while for this. Yeah. I have it already started. What we can also do is that while this thing is firing yeah. up, I can show this mixing with uh, yes. Oh, okay. yes, do that, mm -hmm. yes, please. Should I take the screen? Yes. yes. All right. OK. There you go. Yeah, and what I will do now is so I'm still in the same example, the Py example. Uh, maybe first I wanted to show you. Okay, let me show you one thing. I will go into the SRC. And there is a little bit. So this is this function uh, which computes this Py approximation. And it is public. But now, now there are, I added very few additional things. I said that I want this to be callable from C, to have a C interface. Mm -hmm. I okay. also want this to be a Python function. So I want this also to be callable from Python. Mm -hmm. And I want to not mangle this. I don't know whether we should go into mangling, but it, in, in brief, it means that when this is compiled, use names which are which also understandable by other languages. This is mandatory when you do this. Yeah. So languages. no mangle makes it understandable, and mangle hashes it or something. Is that so the case? Yeah, it, it adds some other. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So normally the the function normally like in Rust it will be like this, mm -hmm. but now I added a few things here to. I added also something else to create a Python module, but it's it's basically all I had to do. Of course, I'm importing some extra. Uh, so that's it's it's basically everything. So for the Python, what did you add? It's uh, mostly like the the version. So for Python, I added, uh, I said, this is a function I want to be able to call. Yeah, mm. and, uh, and below and you below, added it. Uh, this, mm. I think we cannot really go into much detail. Okay, but it's mostly saying mm. you have a, yeah, it's quite simple. It's okay, nice. yeah. Yeah, nice. I define a version and I define that that function yeah. is part of that module and. And you give the can, name, yeah. This can return like success yeah. or failure. Mm -hmm. And this will create this will create my Python interface. Oh, okay. that's nice. Uh, that's super simple, actually. Using this module, PyO3. Mm -hmm. And I already mm -hmm. have it. And now, <clears throat> okay, let me show you one more thing. And that I have one more dependency here, and that's uh, Maturin. And ma oops, Maturin is the equivalent of a few, a few episodes ago, we talked about Flit. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So it's a bit. This takes care of, like, I don't have to create a setup.py. Mm -hmm. I have this very very thin Py project, and now I say, I, what what do I say now? I say Maturin develop release. Okay, nice. Oops. Ah, okay. I didn't install. I didn't install yet. Let me use my alias to install the virtual environment. So installing Maturin. So Maturin is a Python, or a, uh, is it Python or is it uh, Rust? It's a Python package which helps me creating Python packages out of Rust projects. Okay, so that's specific for Rust, yeah. Yeah, and I can do now a Maturin develop, and later I could do Maturin publish, and that's it. And mm. then I have my package on PyPI, and that's all. Oh yeah, nice. I didn't know that. Yeah. But now it's now it's doing its thing. This uh, this will take just a few seconds, and then I will show you. I want to show you that out of Python, I can now import this thing that I just programmed in Rust, and I mm -hmm. can call it. Here, let's do it. So here, mm -hmm. I called Python. I will. Ah, this is so annoying with the screen. I imported this package and I called this function out of Python. And I could also show, but I think I will not do it. I mean, here is a description on how to how to call it out of Fortran and how to call it out of C or C++. There is also, there are Rust packages that help to interface C++ specifically with Rust to make these things easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see some things here that sort of remind me of other things I've done when making Python extension modules, like mm -hmm making the C functions with certain types and then also Excuse with Cython me. defining the module initialization thing and yes. yeah. So it's a beautiful uh, Rust library that helps with that. And one can mm -hmm. make really Python, even Python like classes are visible from Rust and vice versa. Mm -hmm. and oh yeah, even classes yeah. you can do that. That's very mm. nice, actually. Okay. So at least that's a nice way to develop and use Rust in your new project, because you can make this uh, like Python. And in terms of uh, performance, this is still very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I uh, often start in Python, and when I realize that somewhere I need really the performance, mm -hmm. that can be done, done in Rust, an interface like that, or or I start out with with Rust, but I would maybe may, like maybe I want this to be pip installable, and mm -hmm. I want it to be so that people working in the Python ecosystem can use it. So then I use this to distribute it through PyPI, mm -hmm. and then Conda, etc. Yeah, no, nice. Actually. How is it? How is the binder doing? Uh, it looks like it says it's pushing the image. Okay, now it says yeah. it's launching the server. Okay, okay. it's so it's very fun. slow at the moment. Let's hope there's not some sort of timeout under the hood, which. Oh, no, but God. these last days it has been quite slow. I, think. Mm. I don't know. Too. 
I have a cool screen. Okay, it just started. Should I? Okay, so if you want to take the screen from me. Okay, here we are. Mm. Okay, so what do I see here? I guess this is the contents of the repository itself. Um, yes, that's so just standard. What should so I? Yeah, I you can open uh, any of the Jupyter notebook. About Rust by examples. This is a hello world and very basics. And this uh, the first one is uh, with some plotting. If you want to show some plotting. Okay. So but this one is what we did. World. And this is using the Rust kernel. Yeah. I guess. Kernel. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, enough for that. So the plotting one. We'll take a look. Okay. So here we are using this plotter, plotters package, mm -hmm. which is a Rust package. Yeah. I guess, are these yeah. already done through Binder? Yes, but okay. this is where if you wanted mm -hmm. to do it yourself. Um, and here yeah. they explain how to interface with this Jupyter uh, mm -hmm. EBC XR yeah. or Rust. It's, uh, it's very much like any other kernel in, uh, in mm -hmm. Jupyter, where you can mm -hmm. extend. Um, and always you, you always okay. need to be some more for plotting to have it in inside okay. the... Yeah. And uh, I found it was, it's always a bit slow here, and you don't see what it does, because it, it is installing. Plotter is an external uh, mm -hmm. package. Ah. And you, yeah, so I mean, here this is a silly square. Okay, so it, what it does. just makes a blue, yeah. Yeah, blue it m makes roll. a blue, and okay. it's filled with blue, a square. Yeah, um, so here we go. It does so, the same, but it, it will print hello world. Yeah. Does every cell need this depth plotters thing? Uh, yeah, I think so. You need to always to tell it it's for okay. their, their uh, plot. Mm -hmm. Is each cell here run in a separate Rust process, or is it a s single? Uh, it's it's one single. Oh. Uh, I I don't know exactly how it works for plotting because I'm not mm -hmm. very familiar with the plotting. Part. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, it's uh, very much like a normal notebook. You can define okay. a variable and you can use it in another cell. Mm. Okay. Which, which is quite nice for such programming language. Yeah, like when it's compiled, yeah, you can still yeah. like execute it piece by piece. Okay, but so it's still here... a, it, it, it can be a bit weird. I found it was a bit weird uh, for explaining, like, uh, if you go until function, you can teach mm -hmm. people how to use it, and it's probably nice for people yeah. to visually uh, try it out. But mm -hmm. as soon as you want to, to go through uh, modules and uh, uh, the cargo tooling, yeah. then you need to move away, which, which maybe is a good way to, to help people to transition mm -hmm. from prototyping to proper Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. Is there anything else in particular I should see here? No, I don't know. You can go below. I think we, we do different plottings. Uh, Try this maybe. One. There is one with, uh, this is a chart. This one, yeah, you can do that one. It will make a sh uh, yeah. mesh. It will be a plot. So th they have very good functionalities for plotting. Mm -hmm. uh, but honestly, I'm not sure this is uh, worth a hassle mm -hmm. compared to, to Python. Yeah, like it seems. Because, yeah. Well, you you would not get more. I mean, the the key for me is the performance. Mm -hmm. uh, I I don't necessarily see the point of uh, learning something new for plotting. Yeah. But maybe because I, uh, plotting is not my uh, primary objective. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems I've frozen the kernel somehow by... It, it's it's quite slow, so this is <laughs> what I, I found. Yeah, when you do this kind mm. of plotting, and I, I don't really know why. And you also mentioned that there is a way to get the command line over the binder, which was new to yeah. me. Yeah, so this I, I ah. found was nice. So if ah. uh, when you go in the home page, you mm -hmm. can new and you can have this uh, terminal. And actually, this is uh, how I used it mostly. 
because here you have the cargo tool in and everything. Okay, yeah. There we go. So now I can. Uh... You can use cargo, uh, and yeah, and then you can uh, you can clone, for instance, a project, and you can run it. That is amazing. I didn't know. Yeah. So th this is quite nice, actually. Uh, I, I found mm -hmm. after trying out the notebook, I, I found if, if I had to use it for teaching, I would probably very quickly mm -hmm. transition to the terminal yeah. and uh, make new project as we did before. Yeah. Like basically, whenever I'm using Jupyter for teaching or research and guiding someone, we always eventually make it to the terminal and then do yeah. something there. Like... I think it's good practice. And then Jupyter Lab, it's even easier to find the terminal because it's on the launcher. Yeah, actually, yeah, probably you could start uh, <laughs> Jupyter Lab. I haven't tried. Yeah. Okay. So, what next? Or I guess it's time to wrap up, actually. It's time to wrap up, yes. So, what have we learned here? Do you want to quickly talk about the memory model in a couple sentences? Yeah, maybe we can say that in a couple of sentences because that's that's new if you come from other languages, but it has certain advantages. So what is different is that it's not like in C, C++, Fortran, we have to explicitly allocate and deallocate. And if you forget it, or if you like use something after having deallocated, or you forget to deallocate, then you get trouble. Mm -hmm. And then there are languages which do garbage collection, like Python and Go. Uh, where you don't have to deallocate yourself, but it gets deallocated somehow at some point by the garbage collector. But Rust is different. So in Rust, you don't do it explicitly, but it's there is an uh, there is an ownership model. So the way I, li mm -hmm. I like to picture it is that memory is like money. I mean, you cannot spend it twice. Mm -hmm. It always belongs to somebody. It cannot. Mm. You cannot, uh, like a memory segment cannot be owned by two variables in Rust. Which also means that you cannot mm -hmm. really get like race conditions and you don't have to worry about mm -hmm. um, like does this, mm -hmm. does this process read before the uh, write before the other one reads. Mm -hmm. Because it always, there is only one owner. Yeah. How can you, can you do things like accessing shared memory or memory mapping files or things like that? Like, can you explicitly get shared memory if you need to? I don't know. Do you mean like shared memory polarization or you mean like, like really managing memory yourself yourself? Like managing memory yourself yourself. Yes. So I you guess. can, if you really want to, you can go like really close to the metal, you can manage everything mm -hmm. yourself. There is also something called unsafe rust. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I didn't that you, that. Can, you can remove these safety mechanisms mm -hmm. if you want to manage yourself, but then the compiler will let you. Yeah. Um, hey, in yeah. which uh, circumstances would you recommend to use this? So I don't, I don't do it. I think it, it can be, if, if it can be useful if, if you really know what you are doing, and I think I yeah. don't know what I'm really doing. Also, yeah, like, I, I, I keep on the, the safety. Yeah. Safety I mean, I guess if you're building an operating system, then you do oh, yeah, yeah, all so kinds of good. things. But as a research scientist, you probably don't need to go that far. Yes, you probably want to stay on the safe side. And if you do, you're doing it just for fun and not out of need. Yes. So when you start working with Rust, I think this is maybe one of the first things that starts to be, starts to like after a few days, this starts to be a little bit difficult because then you hit that because that's different, mm -hmm. and then you think, wow, the compiler is really annoying. Why doesn't it let me doing this? But mm -hmm. it it almost always signals that we are trying to do so that's something that we shouldn't be doing. Yeah. But other languages let us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, actually, I like this part because I yes. found it was like in the Fortran world, which is yeah. very safe mm -hmm. for this. Yeah. It's like you can't just translate a language from one to another, but you have to actually rebuild it the way it's designed to. And yes, this way will yeah. be better overall. Yeah, it will guide you towards this safer code. Yeah. Memory safe or thread safe code. Mm -hmm. Just by just by the, the fact it is designed. Yeah. So should we 
yes. wrap up now, wrap up. or is there more? I think I've learned what I've needed to. I've seen some examples, so yeah. Um, Will you start soon, Richard? <laughs> I don't know if I had a need to. Unfortunately, I don't get that deep into the stuff anymore. But will you recommend it? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, when someone is interested in learning a new language for fun and is starting a new project, which many people don't have time to do that. Actually, I think I would recommend for research software engineers to, mm -hmm. to look at it as a, maybe a future language. Yeah and uh, worthwhile yeah, for, for, sure. for the community we are serving. Yeah. OK, well, thanks to everyone for watching. I guess next week we go back to Thursday evenings. And yes. we'll show the subject yet. Mm -hmm. Have we decide? Oh, if we have to decide a subject. I think to be confirmed, because it also depends on Oh, yes, to be so confirmed. But, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, next Thursday evening. Yeah. Maybe with an interview. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, and okay. suggestions welcome. So suggestions through uh, I don't know Twitter mm -hmm. through HackMD. Yeah. Which or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. And thanks for watching. Bye for now. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Bye.